Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're talking about Divine Mercy and St. Faustina Kowalska. Yeah, we're going to look at the life of St. Faustina. We're going to look at the image of the Divine Mercy and the miracles around it and some of the things that you never knew about the Divine Mercy. The great secretary of mercy itself, the apostle of Divine Mercy, St. Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. Great. It's good to have you guys back in the studio. Ryan Delacross here with Father Rich Pagano and Ryan Shield, of hey guys. course. What's up? I love Zing. this. This is my favorite topic. This one's for you. And if I had if I had the privilege of a girlfriend in heaven. <laughs> not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. No. You are forever Gosh. alone. <laughs> you are married to Jesus and the church. I love St. Faustina Forget so much, it. man. She came into my life back when when Father Mikolenko, the vice postulator of her cause. Uh, came into my life where I was probably like a year into just following the Lord every day. And she became my the center of my life, man, reading her diary, getting to know her, reading Father Michelinko's sister's, uh, her book, yeah. um, just an amazing time in my life. And she's been, you know, my go-to for, for many, many years. And she's helped me get through some very difficult periods of my time too. She's an incredible saint. Yeah. One of the things that um, I always go back to in my life personally and spiritually is um, the, what she wrote about mercy and, and how the, the worst sinner in the world has more merit to God's mercy than any other sinner. Mm -hmm. And it just like awoke in me this, this precious like divine mercy that God gives us in our sins and, and it, it helps us to, to kind of move away from the guilt and into the mercy of God. And and that, that to me is like something that our, our world needs. It's something that our church needs. And yeah, that you, immersive you, mercy that's, mm, that's related mm -hmm. to the ocean as an image, as a metaphor that she articulates so well in, in the diary is so refreshing to think that, you know, at times when we look in the mirror and we think about our sins, guilt becomes so overwhelming but to realize that there's a greater overwhelming force, and that is the ocean of God's mercy that can wash away any amount of guilt or any amount of shame associated to whatever sin that you've committed. Yeah, you yeah. touched on something I think really important is just how much of a lack of mercy there is in the world and how the lack of mercy leads to so many people carrying around just unbearable amounts of guilt and struggle and how necessary and how super abundant the mercy of Christ is and St. Faustina being that apostle of mercy and bringing that specific desire of our Lord to show how overwhelming and how limitless his mercy is, is just, she's, that's why we're doing this episode. That's why when we are going on this pilgrimage, uh, May 13th to the 22nd, that we are going to spend so much time, um, Getting to know getting her. Getting to know her. Yeah. Especially, you know, this pilgrimage is going to be about Pope St. John Paul II, but... But who is Pope St. John Paul II without St. Faustina? Yeah. And who is St. Faustina's cause and the, the propagation of divine mercy without Pope St. John Paul II? They're yeah. so, hand in hand. so entwined. So yeah. now, before we get into that, why don't you tell everyone how they can find us and how they can find out more about this pilgrimage? Sure. So if you're very interested in joining us on pilgrimage, it is going to be a pilgrimage of a lifetime, celebrating the 100th birthday of John Paul II, getting to know the great Polish saints and St. Maximilian Kolbe, as well as St. Faustina Kowalska. And we're going to be visiting the great site where her remains are and, and the beautiful shrine of Our Lady, or well, excuse me, of, of Divine, Divine Mercy. Mercy. So we want you to visit that. If you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash pilgrimages, there's a pilgrimage, pilgrimage, excuse me. Um, there, there is a clear, uh, you know, kind of clear cut explanation of where we're going to be day in and day out. There's pricing and there's a way that you can sign up for the trip on the site. And, and uh, we would love for you to join us. 
And most certainly every episode that we do is driven through YouTube and various ways that you could listen in from Stitcher to Google Play to uh, Spotify, as well as uh, if you have an iPhone through the podcasting uh, application on iTunes. So we want to make sure that you're you're figuring out every way that you can uh, that you can listen in or view our content. If you are listening in, be sure to subscribe on all of those channels, as well as YouTube. If you're viewing our content, be sure to go to YouTube and type in Catholic Talk Show. Hit the subscribe button and click the little bell next to the subscribe button so you can get everything that we produce. And if you're if you're a real supporter of our show and you like this content, please consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show, and there you'll see many different tiers of how you can support us financially to make sure that this show reaches new markets into the future. All right. Well, thank you for that, Padre. Yeah, man. Thank so you for this show. I, I, I love St. Faustina, as you, as you I know. I know you do. You know, the, the, I, I used to teach catechesis in confirmation prep, and at, toward the end of the year, this kid came up, and a number of the kids got me gifts. So I opened up this one box, and I, I pulled out. It was a statue of St. Faustina, and I looked at it. And I'm like, how did, you know, how did you know that I love St. Faustina? She's like, Rich, you talk about her like almost every class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, St. Faustina is remarkable. And the story of the propagation of the divine mercy is remarkable. And the twists and turns that it take. And uh, some of the things that people, I don't know, I, I think people don't realize how miraculous this image is mm -hmm. and what it has done for the world. So I think let's get back to, you know, and start from the beginning. Uh, St. Faustina, uh, she was born in Poland in uh, 1905 and was born as uh, Helena Kowalska. Kowalska. Um, and she was, by all accounts, more or less a very average girl. She was the third child of 10, poor family, religious family, but nothing particularly remarkable about her. Um, but she, in, you know, in the recountings of her life, she tells how she first felt the calling to religious life. And when she was at, um, when she was 16 years old, um, she was at a dance. Um, so but even prior, even prior to the dance, she had a desire to become oh, yeah, a sister was. from very, very early on, but her father strictly forbade it. And he was very staunchly in the position that she was not to become a nun. And then fast forward, you know, she, she was obviously very hurt by that. Mm -hmm. But then fast forward to this dance where she had gone for many years feeling very despondent about the fact that she couldn't proceed toward religious life. Yeah, so she went to a dance with her sister, uh, Natalia. And at this dance, she had a vision of Jesus. And she ran from this dance and ran to the local cathedral and was it a dancing Jesus? No, it no. was a wound. It was a wounded, wounded. Jesus. Yeah. And he had the suffering. crown of thorns and it was the suffering Jesus. And he said, how long are you going to make me wait? Oh, wow. you know, and, and ima imagine that because she's just a girl at a dance mm -hmm. trying to be a normal kid, whatever mm -hmm. has this vision, vision of a suffering Christ and is so overwhelmed. She runs to the, to the cathedral for which I can only imagine was her response of looking for a, like, oh, I need to get to a holy place. And there uh, she recounts that Jesus said, leave immediately and go to Warsaw and join a convent. And she packed her bags the next morning, got on a train and went to Warsaw with no plan, no plan, no money, young girl with nothing to her name. no, And, and just went immediately to the first church that she found and attended mass. And... From there, she's tried to join a bunch of convents and was wandering around the city like, what should I do? Jesus, what, I mean, come on, you got me in a mess here. Knocking on convent doors. And they're and, all like, go away, little and, girl. And, yeah, and it's like, here's this young girl saying, Jesus is calling me to be, you know, a religious sister, a nun. Yeah. yeah. And she did not have, <laughs> she was so poor. I mean, you know, you had to be able the to. dowry. The dowry, and, that, yeah. and, and she couldn't provide it. I mean, she's essentially a runaway. Um, so this is going on for like a while, uh, like a full y two years. She's wandering essentially around Warsaw, working as a housekeeper, taking any odd job she can, trying to get into a convent. It's crazy. She uh, worked very hard in those years to yeah. be able to provide for that, that dowry. So yeah, what happened was she finally found an, an order that would take her, but they said, what you need to do is you need to be able to pay for your own habit. Mm -hmm. So she 
got on an installment plan with the convent where she went and was working and cleaning houses and taking a, all that she could to give to buy this um, habit and just keeping just enough Did to live on. Did cost a lot of money back then or no, something? No, but she no. was broke. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. No money. Yeah. And but finally, she was um, she entered into the congregation of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy. And on uh, April 30th, 1926, she finally received her habit and took the name of Sister Maria Faustina of the Blessed Sacrament. And in 1929, she took her first religious vows as a nun. Now, well, where does Faustina come from? Because her name was Helena Col- Kowalska. Kowalska. Mm-hmm. So uh, where does Faustina come from? Faustina, there's there's a lot of uh, saints like uh, Faustinius, and they're kind of more obscure Roman saints. Oh, uh, okay. So, Interesting to look into. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly why she took that name. Actually, I did at one point, and I can't quite remember. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't recall either. Um, but still, the courage and the devotion of this girl to be at a dance with her sister, young, and then just take off, and then live essentially a vagabond life in a distant city trying to get, I mean, guys, I even, there's days where I struggle to get out of bed to get the mass. Mm -hmm. You know, the devotion here, I think was an early sign of just how special this saint was going to be. It's also to the journey of uh, uh, the, the journey of, you know, once you fall in love with Christ or you have this encounter that it's it's never really like a clean break into something that's like yeah this is yeah you call me here I am it's mm-hmm. never that way it's all there's always a struggle there's always your faith being tested there's always something that gets in the way there's always human interactions that deter detract you know and and and, and it, it, it reinforces and empowers you even more when you land right when you land that plane. Mm-hmm. And that's a great segue into her life as a religious, because that was exactly what her life was met with in respect to a lot of opposition, a lot of, you know, people questioning these locutions, these religious experiences, um, you know, where she discovered the relationship that that God was calling her to in relationship to Father Sapochko, her spiritual direction, director, but I think what you were mentioning too, Sheila, is we could see very much from the infancy of this call that the type of vocation this was going to be was going to be a very dramatic one one, and a dramatic one for sure. So St. Faustina, her whole life, she experienced visions of Our Lady and Our our Lord and different saints and saints and and also demonic oppression. Mm -hmm. And um, she was really troubled by this and a lot of religious uh her spiritual directors would kind of say oh you're you're hysteric and this is you are you schizophrenic what's going on here and she kind of had a lot of suffering because people discounted this now finally her religious order moved her to uh um lithuania eventually and then she was moved to one of the houses there and there she met blessed yeah. yeah blessed blessed, blessed. Yeah. Uh, Michael Sapochko, and he was the first one to say, "Hey, sister, there might there's something here," and she shared with him that the vision that she had of our Lord, and she wrote in her diary that she had a vision of Jesus that he appeared to her in her cell wearing a white garment, and one hand was raised in the gesture of blessing, the other was touching the garment at his breast, and from beneath the garment, slightly drawn aside at the breast, there were two emanating large rays, one red, the other pale. Jesus commanded her then to have this image painted and blessed on the first Sunday after Easter to be known as the Feast of Mercy. So, I mean, this was a very specific direction, and Father Michael Sapochko really was the one who kind of got this devotion going. He 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 was the one who commissioned the painter to have the painting done, uh, and without him, this, this devotion uh, would not have taken off. And he's really kind of underlooked in his role in all of is this. Is there any story about how they found the painter? Is there any like, there, uh, there, at, there is, mm-hmm. you know, and he was, he was agnostic in every respect. The painter himself, the painter himself was. And, and St. Faustina was not happy with, with, with what that. he was producing at so, all. Yeah. The, the painter's name was Eugene Kazmierowski mm-hmm. and he began painting it. And <laughs> 
St. Faustina said, this is ugly. <laughs> and she did not like it. <laughs> and this poor painter uh, repainted the face 26 different times. Because she's like, no, it's ugly. It doesn't look like him. It's not. And you could imagine this agnostic painter. Like, lady, come on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, lady, come and, on. And, you know, you have Father, <laughs> Father Saposco who's like kind of playing both sides. He's like trying to pastorally bring him in yeah. and just continue to encourage him. Like, yeah, please while, just while she was giving work him the with business. her. Work yeah. with her. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, you know, and I think one of the things is that the, the image is not like, like Our Lady of Guadalupe. It is not drawn by the hand of God, right? This is drawn by, this is devotional, drawn by a very flawed artist, right? And there's a lot of different images. And I think the one that most people think of is not the original one. Most people have in their head when they think of the divine mercy, some of the later paintings or some of the laser, later versions. But that first version, something very interesting about the image of the divine mercy, the original painting, is that if you overlay the image of the Shroud of Turin on the image of the Divine Mercy, they are almost an identical match. You mean the face? The yes. face? If you lay it over the face. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the the physiological structure of the faces and how they are constructed. It's striking. And this would not have been, you know, available to Eugene Kazmierowski. You know, it was just kind of divine providence. But if you overlay them, and I'll put this out there, it's identical. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It really is. I, I recall seeing that video for the first time that Father Seraphim sent me and chills up and down my spine to see how closely they resemble. And it's, it's almost like an exact, you know, the facial structure, the cheekbones, everything, everything. Is, is just an exact replica. Of and it only took powerful. 28 times. And a lot times. of a lot of frustration. Patience. And, oh yeah. So when we think we keep on coming back to the same limitations and the same frustrations, and we're getting tired of the the suffering and the toil of life, realize that God's working out a miracle in in your life. So be That's patient. Right. Yeah. That's right. So, but not too long thereafter. Faustina was never really in good health. She kind of suffered poor health her whole life. Um, and she, she, her health started to decline pretty rapidly. So that first image of uh, the Divine Mercy was painted in 1934. And by 1938, she was dead. Um, oh. Yeah. She did not have, I mean, she, she was died. in her 30s when she She's died. 33. 33. Yeah. Yeah. She prophesied her own death. Yeah. Yeah. The she, total mystic. Yeah. And, you know, in bed, her suffering, she really reunited them, but the, the visions continued happening. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, even like one of the things before she died, when she was, you know, really ill, she predicted that uh, World War II was going to happen. I mean, this mm -hmm. was a really mystic, prophetic. mystic saint. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. prophetic. Um, predicting World War II, saying a terrible war would break out. And it did. And the story of the Divine Mercy is also very tied to World War II. Um, so after she died, Father Father Michael, Blessed Michael Sapochko, was able to start, um, he started having these this image and this devotion and this chaplet of divine mercy um, starting to be uh, printed out and spread, right, the, on these prayer cards. And the, the fate of Poland in World War II, a year after St. Faustina died, Poland was invaded by the Nazis. And this prayer card brought so much hope and so much, um, I guess, national pride and unification in the face of just this monstrous barbaric invasion. There was effects of the spreading of the devotion that, that happened, these beautiful accounts and testimonies throughout World War II and, and different pockets of people who had received these images. But for the most part, in the experience of, of Blessed Sapochko, that the, there was suppression. Mm -hmm. There was rejection of the image. There was rejection of the devotion. The teachings of St. Faustina were being called into question. He was not receiving open doors whatsoever. And it got to the point where not only St. Faustina suffered tremendously, but she entrusted him with this message, her diary, the image itself, for him to distribute. 
And toward the end of his life, he felt like his whole priesthood was a wash. He felt like he was a total failure. Mm. And, and I mean, think of like the heartbreaking nature of like trying to pass on something that you entirely believe came from God and yeah. for it not to be received. And more than not received, it was specifically forbidden it, by the Vatican. John the 23rd um, signed a document saying that this is a suppressed work. I mean, this mm-hmm. was shut down. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's important to realize that in that process, there were a couple of people that received this message in hand. One of them, a priest that brought it to America, mm-hmm. and then the other, JP2. Right. And JP2 met Sapochko before he died. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm. So um, Cardinal uh, Ottaviani, you know, of the Ottaviani intervention, and, you know, he was a very... Traditionally minded uh, cardinal. What's the Adavayani? That's his name. Uh, the Adavayani intervention. It's another episode, right? We'll do an intervention. Yeah, it's basically him saying he was one of the cardinals who very vehemently fought against the removal of Latin and the new and the Novus Ordo. Okay. Anyway, but um, he was actually the one who got uh, Pope say John the twenty third to sign this ban, and it said. Images and writings that promote devotion to divine mercy in the forms proposed by St. Faustina are for expressly forbidden. Mm-hmm. This is only, this is 1959. So, yeah, it wasn't, yeah. It's 1959, and it was shut down as, you know, like, Medjugorje should be, right? And <laughs> <laughs> that was a dig. That was a dig. Suppressive authoritarian. Yeah. 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 No, there, there's there's importance to be given to grassroots movements and the spirit and the charism that yeah. comes from the people of God that embrace devotions that confer grace and consolation. The divine mercy is a perfect example of that. Mm-hmm. Certain uh, yeah. aspects of Medjugorje yeah. without being, uh, you know, being the type of authoritative figure because I have not investigated Medjugorje, but I've been many, many times. I have received great consolation and there are great things happening there. But to realize that, you know, when God's will (laughs) is present and commissioned, it will happen. Mm -hmm. And clearly it, it encountered great difficulty, great turmoil. But the fact that John Paul II, when he was named Pope, you know, flipping over a stack of papers when he walked in, and the first thing he's looking at is St. Faustina's cause. Now, here's the thing, though, that it's important to note that this was not just a pet cause of John Paul II and that he didn't use his newly elected office as pope to, to approve this. Matter of fact, it was the ban was lifted before he was elected pope. So it's not it was not a uh, kind of he didn't ram it through because he had a personal devotion. It's not like that. So the ban stayed in place for almost 20 years. Whoa. And um, when uh, Archbishop uh, Wotia, who later became uh, John the, uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, he started the process of looking into the virtues of her life and uh, putting it to the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith. But it, would, it had happened under um, Paul VI that the ban was list, mm-hmm. lifted. So, but it was John Paul II's. So the reason that it was banned was because the Vatican was provided, provided with faulty translations. Mm-hmm. Of oh, the, original, the translations were terrible they, from the like, Polish. Because, you know, these translations were coming out of first Nazism and then the Eastern Bloc of communism. And transmitting this, this book in, a, in its proper sense was really difficult. So it kind of, to my understanding, that it had went from Poland to France, where it's translated into French, and then from French into Italian, then given to the Vatican, Ooh. and by then it's telephone, and the 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 theological virtues of it had been obscured by all these steps in translation, and then you know under you know the communist <coughs> block of the next twenty years, it really took um, a strong bishop who could stand up to communists like. JP2. And JP2. New Polish. That new Polish. To <laughs> you can read the original. Actually, yeah, to provide yeah. the proper translations. And, well, once that's they, a big deal. and once they saw the proper translations, like, oh, no, wait a second. Oh, no, this is fine. Yeah. Right? This is okay. And beyond fine, it's without error. And right. theologically is related to a Thomistic theology. And, you know, people just reading it without knowing the history of St. Faustina 
could say that this person is very well knowledge in relationship to theological structures and systematic theology. Yep. She is brilliant. And my prayer, and I pray that I could see this in, in my lifetime, which would be incredible, but to see her named a doctor in the church would be a tremendous Absolutely. attribute and very yeah. fitting attribute to her, yeah. her contribution. Something really interesting is that how intertwined John Paul is with the divine mercy. And this is a really interesting fact is that he is the saint who opened her cause, beatified and canonized Faustina. He died on the eve of the divine mercy. Mm -hmm. He was beatified on divine mercy Sunday and he was canonized on divine mercy Sunday. So the story of the divine mercy is so tied to Pope St. John Paul II. So when we're on this pilgrimage, exploring the life of, of our beloved Pope, it, it makes no sense for us to not really explore the divine mercy and go and venerate the relics of St. Faustina because it is so intrinsically tied to him. True. It is mm. very true. Yeah. I'm thrilled about, yeah, me about too. this trip. So before we get uh, into a, f a few last points, um, why don't you tell everybody about our sponsors? So let's hear from our sponsors. We want to give a big shout out to our sponsors, Exodus 90, as well as Hallow. Exodus 90 is a great program out there for all men considering taking the next step in their faith journey. With other brothers, they spend 90 days living austerely and praying and performing different acts of penance and austerity. Now, I've done this experience. Cold showers aren't too bad. And praying through Exodus can only give you a greater sense of an impetus to break through the chains of your own life with other brothers finding greater freedom in the prayer life. We also want to recognize our sponsor, Hallow, a great application that has quickly become the number one prayer app on the App Store. So be sure to check out Hallow, and there you'll find all these beautiful prayers that they've uploaded from daily meditations to rosary to scripture, Lexio Divina, and so much more. These young people were inspired by the applications like Calm that are out there. And this helps people calm down and meditate and center their thoughts. Well, this is a great form of meditative prayer in the Catholic tradition that's being driven through an application. Hallow creates a wonderful sense of our Catholic heritage of prayer, and they have just about everything, and they're continuing to expand their product as time goes on, so be sure to check them out. And if you do, visit their website and use the promo Catholic Talk Show, and you'll get premium contact for, for content for 30 days. And by using that, you'll be able to explore their full capacity of what they're offering. So be sure to check out Hallow, a great app for prayer. All right. Thanks for that, Padre. So I mean, what does devotion to divine mercy look like in your guys' lives? Like, how do you, you know, do you guys have a particular devotion to divine mercy Sunday or the chaplet of divine mercy? Do you have her, that image in your house? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I got a, I got an icon that this lady did in San Diego. It's just really beautiful. It's just kind of like his head, his face. Um, and you know, I, when I was in the seminary, I read the diary and, uh, it just seemed like such a very, like you, you, you were talking about systematic theology and the structures of theology. And I think like, kind of like, you know, more of a, a, a an academic, when you say that dissertation or academic, you know, but when I read, uh, the diary, it was, it was deeply spiritual to me. It's like deeply spiritual and, um, beautiful. And, and it just blessed me a lot. It was very big book, you know, but you know, then, then praying the chaplet and stuff like that. You know, we, when my kids were little, we would play, play this, like, uh, there's a divine mercy chaplet video online. It's kind of weird if you watch it, but you can play it. And, uh, we used to just go to bed every night with the kids and just put it on and sit down with them. Cause you know, you didn't want mom and dad near you. So we put this on, they just be out, you know, that's excellent. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm always, I'm, I'm in need of a renewal, I believe in this particular regard. I think this, uh, this pilgrimage could, could be something that would, would provide that. And obviously learning a lot about the information surrounding it certainly helps, you know, because yeah. you're, yeah. For, for me, the, the, uh, the sense of the diary has been a, a huge part of my journey as well. And, and you're right. 
When it comes to the theological analysis, it's more of the interactions that Faustina has with Jesus and these interlocutions that she has that was analyzed. That was and a six dollar word. Good what's job. What's an interlocution? It's, it's like, talking. It's yeah. So so, so uh, <laughs> yeah. It's the the inner voice of Jesus in yeah. her in her prayer life. Um, she would also hear, you know, very audibly and also see him visibly in apparitions. But when it comes to interlocutions, that's, that's something that's happening within hearing the voice of Christ and all of that was analyzed. But what you brought up, what you brought up is a very great point. It's, it's a dialogue and, and it's also her, her theological ruminations and, and just very mystical sharing of her testimony of, of faith. Uh, in many different regards, so it's true. It's 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 tr- truly a diary. It's it's not like a uh, it's not like a you know the the method the summa. Of, the it's, summa not, yeah, it's not Thomistic. Yeah, it's not it's not Thomistic. But but the structures of of how she articulates in this relationship has been analyzed and related in that yeah. in that Is way. There, are there any like mystics that uh, have? produce works like this and before because you know you look at like saint thomas aquinas or you know some of the church fathers and you don't mm-hmm. get that mystical mm-hmm. you know you get you get more of a doctrinal you yeah. get more of a I say teresa of uh, avila teresa of avila without yeah, a doubt yeah. okay. that's the first person that comes Me to too. mind but conf- the confessions of saint augustine yeah so wow. the, con- yeah, the confessions was, are, yeah. are driven in a similar light um but you could tell that augustine is driving it very uh, systematic thoughts. And he's like, I'm going to convince you very persuasively. Yeah. But that, but that's just, ju- dude, she's journaling, man. Like she's, there's a difference of intent. Yes. Augustine was using his experience uh, almost, you know, in the, tr- in the tradition of the great Roman orators, you know, and it was a specific type of writing. But if he, if you'd read his personal diary, it'd have been different, but this is Faustina's personal diary. So the nature of it is therefore fundamentally different. And I think yeah. the intention has to be Jesus saying, write these things down. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> you know? why you say the secretary. Yeah. The secretary. secretary of divine yeah. mercy. So I think when we go on this, um, on this pilgrimage that if we, we really got to make sure that we pray a chaplet of the divine mercy Without a doubt. at her tomb, uh, you know, but on the bus as well. That's the, the way that's there. the best part about, you know, the bus, the bus trips, you have some video, you have uh, some, some rosaries, some chaplets, some songs, and and also just naps. You know, some time <laughs> naps certainly, <laughs> and uh, you know some time to also reflect and and read some material and and, and process. You know, and her tomb is a place where where miracles happen. You oh know? yeah. So one of the miracles that led to her canonization actually occurred at her tomb, right at, at um, the uh, Cathedral of Divine Mercy. There, and it was a woman from Massachusetts. Right. She was on pilgrimage mm. to there to pray at her tomb. So if, you know, if anyone going on this pilgrimage has, is, has causes to bring with you, this is a very powerful place. Now we're going to go to a lot of places where you can pray, but bringing these causes to St. Faustina's tomb, uh, very powerful. So this woman from Massachusetts was on a pilgrimage there and she had been suffering from a disease that like was destroying her for decades. Like it was so bad that her, one of her legs had been amputated and it was incurable and it was, wasting her away. And she went to the tomb and she heard a voice say, ask for my help and I will help you. And she asked and the pain stopped. Wow. And within two days, all of the symptoms of this disease that had led to her leg being amputated was removed. And she got back and within five days, she was back in Boston. Doctors examined her and they said, there is no medical explanation, but this is completely healed. And she had witnesses uh, that were with her on this pilgrimage. It's pretty awesome. Listening crazy. to that story, I'm getting more and more excited. I can even see her tomb in my mind, and just going there with the group and seeing and going there with you guys as well. I'm just, I'm just thrilled. Yeah. You've been what, there before. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been twice. But this wow. is, this is my first trip back as a priest. So to be able to celebrate the liturgies and the masses associated with our pilgrimage. It's going to be huge, but it's interesting that you say that because the second miracle that led to her actual canonization was a priest who said a mass, um, you know, for this, for that particular intent. So there was Father Ronald Pytel. He had, since he was a child, he had a heart defect and it escalated into cardiac failure and he had had open heart surgery. And he prayed the chaplet of divine mercy every day. And he read the, the diary 
And um, when he uh, got better from this, one of the first masses he was able to celebrate was mass on St. Faustina's feast day. Wow. And he asked everyone there to pray with him and to uh, do a healing ministry and pray over him. And then that night after saying mass on the feast of St. Faustina as a priest, he's like, he, he took his heart medicine and his heart medicine was messing him up. So he's like, Oh, something's wrong. My heart's wrong. And he keeps taking this heart medicine. So like two days later he goes, he's like, I think maybe my dosage is wrong or anything. So they test him. They're like, well, the reason your medicine's messing you up is because you don't have a heart condition. Why are you taking this medicine? You don't need this medicine because his heart condition he had since a child was completely gone. So the heart medicine was now negatively impacting him. And it was complete relief of his symptoms within three days of the celebrating mass on the feast of St. Faustina. That's outstanding. I love that the feast of St. Faustina and St. John Paul II are in the same month and it's the month of our lady. Mm -hmm. October. 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 That's it. Lady of the Rosary. Yeah. So the divine mercy Sunday, that's the, the Sunday after Easter. That's a very, um, a very powerful feast. It's kind of like when you make a Sunday like that, it's pretty epic in the yeah. church. Mm-hmm. When you when you do something, you say, That's hey, this... prime real estate in the church's calendar, the Sunday uh, after yeah. Easter, you know? And the fact that that has been placed in our liturgical calendar is mm-hmm. pretty amazing, mm-hmm. given the story and this background of this, you know, young lady and her struggles and, you know, the struggles of this message. And wow. It's just amazing. And St. Thomas, <clears throat> it, it's like St. Thomas Day, you know, where, where we reflect on doubting Thomas and, and yeah. you know, touching the wound of, of Christ, that this has been the tradition for so long, and there has been a feast of mercy associated with it, but this has given a greater yeah. focus as to what is being celebrated here, the, you know, within the octave. At that very next Sunday of Easter, the first Sunday of, e- you know, that that first weekend after the celebration of Easter, and it's the mercy of Jesus Christ expressing to Thomas. Mm-hmm. You know, That's awesome. Oh, I just, I love that connection. Yeah. I mean, the fact that the divine mercy happens the Sunday after Easter and the way that it has been granted all of these privileges by the Pope, it is the highest uh, endorsement that the church can give to a private revelation. Mm-hmm. There is, you cannot, so uh, papal infallibility, proclaiming the certain, the sanctity of the mystic, granting a universal feast, and there's the indulged act of attending. It's a plenary indulgence if you attend uh, mass at, on the feast of divine mercy uh, under the normal conditions of achieve, you know, mm-hmm. of attaining a plenary indulgence. So, I mean, this is a very powerful intercession and a very powerful opportunity uh, to to experience that mercy through a plenary indulgence and the yeah. novena associated with it, going from Good Friday all the way up to yeah Divine Mercy Sunday yeah yeah that's pretty cool. So you know I'm really excited to go on this pilgrimage. I'm really really excited for all of you to go with us and to go to the Cathedral of Divine Mercy and pray at her tomb, pray the um pray pray the chaplet. See how John Paul impacted her and how she impacted John Paul. And to open up the teachings of JP2 yeah. as well as St. Faustina and to really to really learn from them. Yeah, all together to, with, in one voice to say, Jesus, I trust in you. Yes. I mean, that's going to be awesome. Oh, it will be. So to learn more about the trip, be sure to go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash pilgrimage. And there you'll see every way that you can sign up as well as where we're going. And we want you to participate with us. So if you're on the fence... Take a jump, man. Join us. It's going to be an incredible experience. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Please continue to support us through the Patreon app at patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show. And my brothers and sisters, we will see you next week, most definitely. But we want to see you on this trip as well. God bless. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen. Amen.